All right, so welcome to this morning session. Our first uh, is second lecture of Shlomo, so we'll continue with his uh, course. Thank you. So yesterday I outlined a very general program of how to engineer four-dimensional theory starting from six dimensions, and I was making certain claims about being able to understand certain properties of these four-dimensional theories in this setup. So today, and uh, we will start adding details and uh, trying to understand uh, what actually we can do and what we cannot do. So I remind you that uh, the basic thing that we want to do, we want to engineer 4D CFTs, say some CFTs in the IR by starting from a flow, flow in a six dimensional, with six dimensional uh, theory. Uh, let us call it CFT UV, which we'll call T6D, and this will be some T4D. So we flow uh, from higher dimensional theory to lower dimensions, and we flow by turning on uh, a relevant deformation, which is uh, geometric. We basically put our six dimensional theory on some geometry, and what we also want to do is not just understand some properties of the fixed point which might be strongly coupled, we want to find a dictionary between such compactifications starting in six dimensions and hopefully some weakly coupled four-dimensional uh, CFT, uh, CFTs which, fall, um, which flow to the same uh, fixed point. And the main uh, idea that uh, uh, I was telling you about why this program might be useful was this factorization property, that if you start uh, from uh, some six-dimensional theory, T6D, and you uh, try to understand how, uh, what, is the, what, what is the theory you get in four dimensions if you uh, compactify on some surface C that you can decompose into, ge into a sum of two surfaces geometrically. Like you just literally break the, the single surface that you have, say something like that in two, two surfaces that you glue together. So this is C, this is C1 and C2, and also we can have some fluxes, and we split the fluxes uh, such that some of the fluxes is equal to our original flux. Then the claim is that in certain situations, this, uh, to understand this problem, we first can understand each ingredient, the compactification on each ingredient, and then combine these ingredients directly in 4D. So this was the statement. Okay. So we can understand first the first piece, then the second piece, and then combine them. And the combination is some field theory operation. Okay. So this is what we are going to, uh, to do today. We are going to understand what goes into this statement and how to derive it or argue for it uh, uh, in, in more detail. Okay. So there are many ingredients to the story. The story is rather complicated and rather nonlinear. So I will try to present some linear story with some perceived logic to it. But as usually is in physics, the, lo the way things work and the way things were derived, they don't follow a linear logic. Okay. So please stop me with questions if you don't understand my, uh, the linear logic I'm going to try to, to sell to you. Okay. So there are different parts of the story. So one part of the story that I will be focusing on eventually is the four-dimensional physics. And remember that we had uh, phrased several questions about the four-dimensional physics. And the main question I will try to understand in these lectures is this uh, phenomenon of emergent symmetries. Okay. The, uh, the phenomenon when the symmetry in the IR is bigger than the symmetry in the UV in this type of a setup. So th this will be my main focus. However, we are uh, engineering this four-dimensional theory starting from six dimensions, so we will need to understand something about six-dimensional physics. Okay. And a very useful step on our way down from six dimensions to four dimensions 
will be actually five-dimensional physics. So in order to thoroughly understand this prog program, you need to understand each one of these pieces uh, separately and together and the way they interact with each other. So again, I will, the, uh, the, the way I will present the things, I will give you very little details about 6D. Okay? There is very little that we need to know about 6D in order for, uh, to work on this type of a program. We need to understand a little bit more uh, about 5D actually, and I will talk a little bit more about 5D. And then the main focus with uh, most, let's say, technical details will be about 4D. So about 6D and 5D, I will just give you the bare essential details, the bare essentials that you, you, you absolutely need to start thinking about this program. Okay, so that will be our plan. So first I will, uh, I will uh, be setting up the general understandings that you need to have in order to start with this program. So first I will talk about some generalities some general setups, general ways to, general questions, technical questions you need to understand before understanding this physical, physically interesting question. And then eventually, I hope in the second lecture today and tomorrow, we will discuss in detail a very particular example of all this program. Okay. So, before starting, let me, uh, let me also tell you what, what the moment you understand that, you know, you need to, uh, the, or you conjecture that uh, in order to understand, understand certain interesting properties of these four-dimensional theories, you are interested in this type of factorization uh, um, program, then uh, you know what are the basic pieces of the program that you need to understand. Okay, if you have a very generic uh, Riemann surface and uh, you conjecture that anything, compactification on any Riemann surface, on this generic Riemann surface, can be understood by understanding the pieces, you can decompose any Riemann surface into small pieces, which will look typically like that. You will have just a tube, a cylinder with two boundaries, which have some, has some flux. And again, we will give some details. So this is one kind of Lego piece that you need to understand in order to be, build arbitrary theory. Another Lego piece that you need to understand is a compactification on three punctured spheres, and say with zero flux, so you can have some flux. And then from these two Lego pieces, by combining them together ge geometrically and in field theory, you will be able to construct any uh, compactification that you want. So I will talk in these lectures mainly or almost uh, only about this uh, piece. It turns out to be much easier to understand. About uh, these pieces, we have very rudimentary understanding. We understand them in some particular cases, but we don't have a generic understanding. And if I will have time tomorrow, I will also talk a little bit about that. So this is where we are going. So setting up. So first thing you need to know is some things about the six-dimensional theories. And you don't need to know much about them. Okay, what, thing number one you need to know is that these theories exist. Okay. And uh, these theories exist. Uh, there, is, uh, there are many attempts to classify these theories. Uh, uh, these theories are highly non-trivial. So if you try to write Lagrangians in six dimensions, you cannot write anything which is interacting. So anything, the only things you can write are free Lagrangians. So these theories in six dimensions are intrinsically strongly coupled. So there are very sophisticated techniques to describe them in string theory, M theory, F theory, and so on. We will not uh, get into this uh, discussion. There is a very nice review that I want to mention, if you're interested in details, which was written recently by Heckman and Rudelius, which is very pedagogic, and I encourage you to read it. Uh, uh, but the only thing that we will need to know is that these theories exist. They have some supersymmetry. The minimal supersymmetry that you have in six dimensions uh, has, is called, uh, uh, the minimal superconformal super algebra is called the 1,0 uh, algebra, and it has uh, eight real supercharges. And there are many theories which uh, uh, which you can build. Some of the theories you know, some of the theories were mentioned before, say by Leonardo. 
So the, the theory that everybody should know is the, the so-called 2 comma 0 theory. Okay? This theory lives, uh, is a theory which lives on M5 brains. Okay? It's uh, maximally super, it's, uh, it's a very nice uh, theory in particular in this 1 comma 0 language. This theory, uh, uh, so as, as you know, as in the lower dimensions, if you have a, a more supersymmetric theory, you can think about it in terms of lower supersymmetry. So here you have uh, something which has more supersymmetry, and you can think about it in one comma uh, zero supersymmetric language. This particular theory, the two comma zero theory, has a global symmetry. Okay, so one thing that will be important for us in this program in, the, in understanding emergent symmetries in four dimensions it will be to understand the symmetries in six dimensions. So one thing you know about this theory, that, uh, in, in, that the global symmetry of this theory is SU2, for example. There are many... So in terms of 1, 0, it's not an R symmetry. So you have an R symmetry and you have a global symmetry, which is SU2. This, all of it uh, fits into SO5 uh, uh, R symmetry of the 2, 0 like the R symmetry and this global symmetry. So we will be talking uh, always in terms of minimal supersymmetry in these lectures. Then you have many other theories that you might uh, heard about or might not heard about. So for example, you have theories which some, uh, sometimes are called minimal CFTs. Which have no symmetry. So one way to describe uh, these theories and theories, one way people study theories in six dimensions is very analogous to what people do with n equal two theories in four dimensions. So the amount of supersymmetry is the same. So what, what you can do in uh, four dimensions is study Coulomb branches of theories, something Leonardo has mentioned uh, yesterday. And you can do the same thing in, uh, in six dimensions. You can go on some branches of vacua in, uh, in six dimensions, you can give some scalars vacuum expectation values. And the analogous branches in six dimensions are called tensor branches. And on these tensor branches, some of these uh, uh, six dimensional theories have an effective description in terms of a gauge theory. It is an infrared free gauge theory. Like when you go on Coulomb branches in four dimensions, you have physics which is infrared free. So this type of theories, for example, correspond to uh, tensor branch effective description uh, based on some uh, groups, some gauge groups, pure gauge groups with no meta. So there is no meta, so there is no symmetry, no continuous symmetry, and the, uh, you can argue that, people can argue that these theories, on these gauge theories on, on these tensor branches, once you switch off the vacuum expectation value, they get to describe some uh, strongly coupled CFT. So there is some list of groups that you can have. Uh, there is some finite classification of these theories. So again, only thing I want you to know is that these theories have, have no symmetry at all. Okay. Then there are other theories which will be uh, interesting to us. For example, you can take uh, these uh, M5 brains, these six dimensional objects, and put them to probe some singularities in string theory. Again, details don't matter, but the point is that you get some 6D theories which have some properties which we know. Okay, for example, you can take M5 brains on a D type of singularity, okay, and let's take some. Uh, element, some algebra in this AD classification, and then you get some uh, six-dimensional theory for each choice of G, which has some global symmetry. And typically this symmetry is, uh, is some subgroup of uh, this G times G. Okay? You have two copies of G, the global symmetry is two copies of G. Sometimes it is bigger than this, but typically it is at least that. And one very particular uh, example that will be important for us will be the theory that one obtains when one takes one and five brain on D4 singularity. This theory is sometimes called an E-string theory. 
Okay, and uh, the global symmetry that this theory has is uh, E8. Okay. This is some theory you can get in six dimension. It has an E8 symmetry. Following this logic, uh, you should uh, have gotten a D4 times D4 symmetry, but the symmetry in this case is bigger. Is, uh, it contains D4 times D4. It's actually an E8. And this will be an example we will discuss later on in detail of this program. Okay, and finally, I want to tell you another thing about six-dimensional theory. So there is a variety of theories. These theories have some global symmetries. There is a wide variety of symmetries. And uh, again, these theories are strongly coupled. We know very little about them. But uh, so we know about their symmetries. We know some other things. For example, what uh, we can know is not just what are the symmetries, but also what are the hoofed anomalies. And Tooft anomalies you can package nicely into something which is called anomaly polynomial. Okay, it's a fancy, fancy way of saying that you know uh, the, uh, the Tooft anomalies of these symmetries. Yes, there was a question. So you, you have a, a, sing, a space which is singular. You have some singularity. You have some some part of the space in which you act with some discrete group, and then it has some singularity, and on top of that singularity, you put the brain. The brain. So it will, it will not be important for us how you engineer this theory. Okay? I will not get to it again. Really encourage you to read this beautiful review if you want the details. The only thing which is interesting for us is that these theories exist, and you can understand their symmetries and can understand their anomalies. How you do that, it's rather complicated. It's a very intricate business how you do that. All of these things are done basically now. Okay? People are working now or in the last five years or so on classifying these theories, computing these anomalies. So it's rather intricate, nonlinear business with a lot of different consistency checks. And you know, it, definitely, I'm not a, an expert on this thing. And I think it will be very hard you know, to present things coherently. And this is a very coherent review, and that's why I'm, I'm uh, really encouraging you to read it. OK, so these things I want you to know about six dimensions. Okay. Now, another uh, nice thing that uh, uh, we will discuss is 5D physics. Okay. 5D will be very important for us. And it will be important for us because we want to do this, to study this factorization. And the way the 5D physics enters the story is the following. So again, we want to understand com compactification of some 6D theory on an arbitrary Riemann surface. Okay? So one thing you can do is take this Riemann surface and represent it like that, like a, a, a very, very, very long tube okay? with some pieces of the surface at the ends of this tube. Okay? Now if you focus on on this tube, of this, on this uh, long cylinder that connects two different pieces of the Riemann surface, it looks as if you took your 6D theory and compactified it on a circle. Okay? So this is the sixth dimension, if you wish. This is the fifth dimension. Okay? Eventually, we are going to compactify both the sixth dimension and the fifth dimension. But we can ask ourselves, can we understand these long cylinders where the kind of, uh, we have an intermediate step where we, we first go to five dimensions. Okay. Now, the interesting, uh, again, fact about this thing is that when you take these six-dimensional theories that you know and you compactify them on a circle, again, you can ask these questions, what type of an effective theory you get in five dimensions when you go to energies far below the scale set by the radius of the circle. In some cases, we know what these theories are. In generic cases, for generic six-dimensional theories, it's actually an open problem to figure out what these five-dimensional theories are. In some cases, we know. Okay? So let me list some examples. So for example, if you take 2 comma 0 on a circle, the claim is that what you get in five dimensions is maximally supersymmetric uh, young mills theory in five dimensions. Okay? It's some gauge theory based on the same algebra that you had here. OK, 
okay? And it has the maximal supersymmetry. Now, as in six dimensions, five dimensional gauge theories are infrared free, okay? So they, are, uh, they seem to be boring theories. So what happens in this particular case, what we believe is that this theory, this maximally supersymmetric young bills theory is not, uh, is not UV completed by a five-dimensional SCFT, but the only UV completion it has is the six-dimensional 2,0 theory. So again, this comes almost trivially, but from what I have told you, there is a 2,0 theory in six dimension. You put, a, you, you deform it in some way, and you get an effective theory, which is this maximally supersymmetric and mills theory. So by definition, the six-dimensional 2,0 theory is a UV completion of this theory. And the claim is that there is no, you cannot find a, you know, a really five-dimensional theory, five-dimensional SCFT, which UV completes this theory. So in this case, we know what happens. In some of these cases that I listed here, we also know what happens. So, so there is a long list of theories here. Not very long, actually. It's very rather short. So there are some gauge theories that you can write. And for some of them, we know what happens in five dimensions, for example, for SU3 and SOA. And it's actually rather non-trivial, but for others, we just don't know. So the idea is that you can list all the possible gauge theories in five dimensions. Again, that's something people do. And then try to understand, can you match these five-dimensional theories to any six-dimensional starting point? And in some cases, we know what the answer is, or we conjecture some answers. In other cases, we don't even know what the answer is, and the effective theory in five dimensions might be strongly coupled. So one ingredient in order to go through with this program, with this factorization program that, uh, that I'm trying to tell you about, is to know what the five-dimensional gauge theory is. So for many cases where we don't know this, what I'm going to tell you about will uh, be, in a sense, useless. Okay? And why is it the case? You will see in... Uh, uh, you will see soon. So for other cases, for this type of theories, for example, we also know what the five-dimensional theory is. And in particular, I want to tell you about the E-string. So in the case of the E-string, the conjecture is that if you just take this E-string theory on a circle, okay, you just compactify it on a circle, what you get in, a, in a five dimensions is a five-dimensional SCFT which is called sometimes uh, Cyberg's E8 theory. If you take the strict limit of uh, the radius going to zero of the circle, you don't do anything else. You get some strongly coupled theory, which has an E8 symmetry. Okay? And this theory has some uh, relevant deformation, some mass deformation, which takes it to be a gauge theory. So this. Uh, after some deformation, this theory actually becomes an SU2 gauge theory plus seven uh, flavors, five dimensions. And this particular gauge theory is conjectured to be UV completed in five, dimen in, in five dimensions by this strongly coupled SCFT. Another important thing I want to tell you is that you have choices. You always have choices upon compactification. So here, when I took this E-string theory on a circle, I did nothing. I just put the theory on a circle and uh, went to, to low energy. But what you can do on a circle, since these theories have global symmetries, okay? so in particular, this E-string theory has an E8 global symmetry, you can turn on holonomies uh, in these global symmetries. So the statement is that if you take the theory on a circle and turn on a holonomy, and we will soon discuss these holonomies in a little bit more detail, such that E8 is broken to a subgroup, which is SO14 times U1, the effective theory you get in, a, in, a, in five dimensions is an, a very similar theory to that, but it's slightly different. It's an SU2 gauge theory plus eight flavors. And this particular theory, it is conjectured again, doesn't have a UV completion in five dimensions. This theory has only UV completion in 
uh, six dimensions by the E string theory. Okay? This is a very confusing uh, set of statements, so you need to uh, digest them. Okay? So taking uh, this E string theory with some holonomy, and holonomy is an integral over the, uh, the gauge field around the circle, so it's some mass parameter. So with this deformation, with this additional deformation, you get a different theory. Now things become even more uh, intricate. Okay. Another thing I want you to know about five dimensions is that when you make different choices, okay, when you make different choices of holonomies, Sometimes you add up, end up in five dimensions with different theories, okay? So, different choices of holonomies might lead to different 5D theories. And let me give you an example of, uh, uh, of uh, when this happens. So, for example, if you take this type of theories, this uh, M5 brains probing some singularity, they are sometimes called conformal matter theories, if you hear this name. Okay, and you take this theory which corresponds, say, to one M5 brain on dn plus three singularity, this is called sometimes the minimal D-type conformal matter, SCFT. And you turn on different holonomies in the global symmetry of this theory, which is actually the G6D in this case is D to N plus 6. Again, it contains this group, but it, uh, it is a bigger group. What you get, you can get three different descriptions. So description number one that you can get is in terms of USP to N gauge theory plus matter plus some number of hypers. It's not important what it is. Turning on different types of holonomies, breaking the symmetry in a different way, you can get an SUN gauge theory plus matter. Okay. And doing it in yet another way, the gauge theory that you get in five dimensions, the effective theory you get in five dimensions is much more complicated. It's a quiver theory. It has the following structure. It is a sequence of uh, SU2 gauge groups ending with a uh, flavor group. So I remind you the notations that Leonardo introduced yesterday. So circles stand for gauge groups, and the number is, uh, uh, is uh, corresponds to. Uh, so when we write circle with n, we mean that we have an SU n gauge group, and we ha when we have a square with a number inside, for example, here is a 4, we mean a flavor symmetry of SU4, and the lines are bifundamentals uh, charged under these uh, symmetries. So when you, uh, when you do some other type of a holonomy, and the number of groups here is equal to n, you get this type of a theory. So all these theories look very, very different in five dimensions. They have actually different symmetries. When you study what are the symmetries of the, these theories, they are very different. And the reason the symmetries are different, because to arrive at the, to them, you have, you have done something different. You've broken the 6D symmetry in different ways. You have turned on different types of holonomies around the circle. So you get these types of theories, which sometimes are called 5D uh, dual to each other. Or I don't know, 5D or 6D dual to each other. And the, the way to think about this duality is not in the usual way you think about the duality. What you can say about these theories is not that they flow to the same theory in the infrared. They are different. Okay? But what is true about them is that they started their life from the same theory. Okay? They are UV dual. Okay? So you start from some uh, same as CFT in six dimensions. You do something different, and you get different descriptions. Okay? So this will be important to us that you can, by turning on suitably holonomies, you can get, uh, in many cases, uh, gauge theory descriptions, and turning on different holonomies, you might end up with different uh, gauge theories. 
And you can see that when n equals 1, so when the singularity is d4, and 1 in 5 brain on d4 singularity is what is called the E-string, all these three descriptions become the same. Okay? So the, all the groups become SU2, and also the matter I did not write here uh, becomes the same. Okay? So this is very, very fast. I just dropped on you some facts. Uh, and uh, I will not talk about them anymore. This is all you need to know about these very generic uh, uh, features of six-dimensional and five-dimensional physics. And now we will uh, discuss a little bit uh, more details, and I will give you a little bit more explanations of what I'm going to say. Yes? Okay, uh, this is an excellent Sorry. question. So the question is: Repeat, please. Uh, if somebody gives us these theories, do we, how do we, should we, can we know that they uh, that they come from six dimensions, from the same six D theory? And the answer is that it is a very, very complicated thing to do. Again, this is a topic of uh, uh, of you know research which is happening now. There are, in certain cases, there are some string dualities that you can employ. You can, you know, do some string dualities, go to five dimensions in these different ways, and understand that, you know, uh, you get one of these theories or get the other theory. Going, you know, if you ignore string theory completely, ignore this higher dimensional physics completely, it's very, very hard to understand that they come from the same theory. And some of these statements are conjectural. There is very little evidence uh, for them. In, in a sense, what I'm going to tell you about four-dimensional physics is going to be a check of these statements. You know, again, as I said, the logic here, I, I present it in a linear way, from six dimensions to five to 40, but actually it's a big set of consistency checks. So there are a lot of claims that you make, and then if all these claims are correct, you know, they should be consistent. Okay? If one of these claims, one of the checks uh, that you perform fails, something is wrong. And you don't know always what is wrong. No, maybe your starting point is even wrong. Like some of the things you said in the beginning is wrong. So this is an ongoing research. It's not a closed uh, chapter in, uh, you know, in physics. Of which? Do we come these ones? So UV completion of these tiers of all of them is the same 6D as CFT. The only UV completion that they have is in 6D. You should think of them as uh, 6D theories on a circle with certain deformations. Okay? Yes. So, so the logic is uh, the other way around. You start from 6D. So this is uh, the, you know, p papers are being written right now about exactly the question you're asking. So say I give you a 5D theory. What you can say about it? There are basically three options. Okay. Option number one, that it, there is some CFT in 5D, which UV completes this theory. Okay, so the, there is some CFT that if you deform it, you, you get some gauge theory description. This is option number one. Option number two, that there is some 6D, higher dimensional theory, which UV completes it. And option number three, that maybe this theory is inconsistent. And what are exactly the criteria, you know, given a, uh, given a theory, where does it fall? It's, it's ongoing research. I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified to say many, much more than I'm saying now, but there are certain techniques. Again, some of them are just brain constructions. You just have some brain construction, which engineers a theory in 6D, then you compactify it on a circle, use some uh, string uh, dualities, you get some five-dimensional theory, which is described by a gauge theory. This is the simplest thing you can do. Other things is literally, there, are, there is a finite, not finite, but simple list of gauge theories you can write in five dimensions. There is some list of theories you can write in six dimensions, and you can basically try to match them using some simple parameters, like matching the moduli spaces and so on. So the, the evidence is very, there, is not, not, there are not many complicated com computations that are done at the moment. Okay. 
So we will be, in a sense, users of, this, uh, of these uh, results. And, you know, we will be making quality assurance that, you know, these claims are correct by, by the logic we will be performing. Okay. So with these general statements about 6D and 5D theories, let me tell you why 5D theories are actually useful. So until now I didn't tell you why they're useful. I just told you that, you know, you can think in Riemann sur about these Riemann surfaces in certain way. And then this 5D, uh, 5D description might be relevant. So why is it relevant? There are two ways in which 5D description is relevant. So one is to understand what is the flux, what, what the flux is, what does the flux do, okay? So again, when I mean uh, uh, flux, what we, we are doing is taking this Riemann surface and we have some global symmetry, say this global symmetry is, U, is a U1, and we just uh, turn on uh, uh, some gauge field con uh, configuration such that if we integrate the field strength uh, over the Riemann surface that we are discussing, we get some non-zero answer. We get something. Okay. So this is the flux supported on this Riemann surface. So let us try to understand what this flux means if we take, you know, this theory, this Riemann surface to be a very, very long tube. And we will cut it at the end soon. So think of it as very, very, very long, finite, but finite tube on which we turn, out, uh, turn on some flux. So what is this flux in five dimensions? Okay. So let us uh, engineer this flux explicitly in a toy example. So this is the sixth dimension. This is the fifth dimension. So this is x6 and this is x5. Okay, so let us turn on a gauge field for this U1 global symmetry, which has the following profile. It's just some parameter m times a hyperbolic tangent of some other parameter lambda times uh, x5. Okay. So this is some gauge field, and you can compute the field strength f. 5, 6, which is just delta 5 of this A6, and you get that this is equal to m times lambda over cosh squared lambda x5. Okay. It's a very simple thing. So what you can see immediately that if you integrate these field strengths over this Riemann surface, you get some non-zero answer. Okay. So this type of uh, gauge field configuration produces flux supported on this Riemann surface. Now look, what is the profile of, this, uh, of these quantities, the A6 and, the, and F? Okay. So A6 is hyperbolic tangent, so it just runs something like that, from minus infinity to plus infinity, and in interpolates between minus m to plus m. Okay. The flux is localized around zero, okay? So this is the flux. And this is uh, this uh, gauge field A, okay? How should we think about this gauge field A? So what is this gauge field A? You can compute the integral of this gauge field, A6, around the, the circle around the six-dimensional circle. So you just compute the integral of this A6 around, uh, around this circle. This is, what is uh, how the holonomy is defined. And this is trivially computed from this expression. It's just m times the radius of the, uh, of, uh, the radius of this circle times a tan hyperbolic tangent of lambda times x5. So what you get here is that you have a holonomy, okay? You have some holonomy, value of which depends on, the pos on your position along the fifth direction, okay? So a, 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 a holonomy which changes in space can engineer for you flux supported on this Riemann surface. And you can engineer the parameters in such a way, take limits on this lambda, that really, like, most of this cylinder has holonomy minus m. 
on this side, on this side you have holonomy M, and there is some you know, sharp transition somewhere on the Riemann surface. Okay? So flux in five dimensions, flux, the six-dimensional flux on this surface is equal to domain wall in five dimensions. Domain wall interpolating different values of these holonomies. But what did we say about different holonomies? When we compactify theories, six-dimensional theories, on a circle with some holonomies, sometimes we get a five-dimensional gauge theory description, right? And here the holonomies are different. So here they don't look very different. It's just m and minus m. But more generically, we can engineer some things which are much more uh, different. And the important thing is that when you look far away from from where this uh, gauge field is changing, this is, looks like 5D theory, uh, 5D, T5DA, some 5D theory which corresponds to holonomy minus M. And here it looks like T5DB, something which corresponds to compactification with, with holonomy M. And sometimes these domain walls are called duality domain walls in 5D. They inter interpolate between two different 5D theories which are uh, UV completed by the same six-dimensional theory. So one thing we learn immediately that there is a very, very nice way to understand flux in five dimensions. These are just these domain walls. Okay? So if you want to understand compactifications from six-dimensional theories, which are very complicated, we don't know much about them, you can first go to five dimensions and at least the flux you can understand in these five-dimensional gauge theory descriptions that you might have in terms of these domain walls. No, no, it is. I just, you know, the, the, it will be the minus of that. Yes. Okay. Any questions about this? Yes. So at the moment, I ignore please. boundaries. Boundaries are really Shlomo, can yes. you repeat, please? So the question was, what happens with the boundaries? Yes. So this is a toy exam. So the question is, what? How should I think about the boundaries, right? So you should. Uh, the only thing I will say, you will properly define it. Whatever you need to define, you will do. Okay? You, I'm just telling you some, you know, a toy understanding of the story. Okay? So the details are usually rather complicated. Well, you know, of, you know, I didn't tell you what the 6D theory is. I just told you, you know, some symmetry and so on. And as you will see in the particular example of the E string that I will discuss, I will not actually derive. I will tell you what the domain wall is. It will be some rather there will be some rather simple description of the domain wall, but the checks that one can perform about this, there is no derivation of it. There is no simple derivation of these domain walls. It's again, it's a guess, and then it checks of this guess, like all the possible checks that you can perform, but we will get there. So at the moment, actually, it's a very tricky and important thing what is happening at the bound. There is, I, I will completely ignore it. It's just too tricky. For example, let me say one thing. You know, the types of flux you can turn on will depend on what types of boundary conditions you, you put in at the boundaries. So things are correlated and, uh, and, and really tricky, but I'm trying to uh, simplify the story. Okay, so this is one thing why, uh, one reason why five dimension is useful. Another reason why five dimension is useful is exactly that. We can try and understand what the punctures are. So for this factorization program, we break our theories into uh, pieces which have punctures, and then we geometrically glue the pieces along the punctures. So what are these punctures? What do we know about these punctures? Okay. So we can learn a little bit about this, again, by studying five dimensions. Okay. So again, we think about the puncture we say we have some very general Riemann surface, something uh, very generic, and then it has a puncture. 
it has a hole in it, and then we kind of zoom on the uh, region of the puncture. And again, we, we, we just think of, of it as a very, very, very long cylinder. And on this cylinder, we can understand the puncture in terms of five-dimensional effective theory. And in cases where the five-dimensional theory, effective theory, has a gauge theory description, again, it doesn't happen always, or we don't always know what is this description. In those cases, since it's, these are just fields, okay, which live uh, in this uh, five-dimensional space, we can understand what type of boundary conditions we can put. Okay? We just need to specify boundary conditions for 5D fields. And since we will want to preserve some amount of supersymmetry in all this business, we want to understand what are the supersymmetric boundary conditions that you can put at these boundaries. And there are a variety of choices. There are a huge variety of choices. In some cases, for some of these compactifications, they were classified and understood. But generically, again, it's an open problem, classifying all the possible boundary conditions. However, there is one type of boundary condition which is kind of universal. It exists for all theories which have this gauge theory description. And it's sometimes called the maximal boundary condition. It's very simple. So you have gauge theory description in these five, dimensional, uh, five dimensions. And what you do, you just take Dirichlet uh, boundary conditions for the gauge field. Okay? And you have other matter fields. And you need to specify boundary conditions for those matter fields. What are those matter fields depends on specific theory you are discussing. But basically what you do, you put Dirichlet boundary conditions for gauge fields. And then whatever supersymmetry tells you you need to do for other fields, you do for other fields. And what happens when you put this boundary condition, the Dirichlet boundary condition for the gauge field, you freeze it uh, at the boundary. So what you acquire is that you have uh, these large gauge transformations which become global symmetry. Okay? So your theory, because you have this puncture, for each such puncture on your Riemann surface, you acquire a global symmetry. So you had here a five-dimensional gauge sy symmetry. You have in the bulk of this five-dimensional theory. And each boundary with such boundary conditions gives you a flavor symmetry which is equal to 5D gauge symmetry. Okay? This is very important. Okay? So punctures come with symmetry. Okay? If you, 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 you don't have to, to put these types of boundary conditions. You can put uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions, more, more sophisticated boundary conditions, and then you can make you know, smaller, uh, smaller part of the gauge symmetry as, uh, to be your flavor symmetry. So this is the maximal symmetry that you can put. That's why it is called the maximal boundary condition. But it is very important that you get these uh, this large gauge transformations as your flavor symmetry. And finally, what we want to do is when we break these surfaces into pieces, what we want to do is to glue them together geometrically. And what it corresponds in this picture we just take two copies of this, uh, uh, of this picture and we remove the boundary condition. We make uh, the, the, the gauge fields dynamical again on this boundary. We just remove uh, this freezing of the gauge fields at the boundary. So what this corresponds to is simply gauging this flavor symmetry, this GF that I called there. Okay. So that's how gluing Geometrical gluing of surfaces becomes a gauging of some symmetry. And the symmetry we are gauging, eventually we will be doing this procedure in four dimensions, but the, the symmetry which corresponds to these punctures is the five-dimensional gauge symmetry. So again, it's a little bit confusing, but needs to be uh, understood. So you start from 5D gauge theory, you freeze, uh, you freeze uh, this uh, symmetry at the boundaries, you get some flavor symmetry, and then if you want to get rid of the punctures, you make this field dynamical again. So you make A mu, you remove 
Dirichlet for MU, and also you should remove Dirichlet for all, if you have other fields which have Dirichlet boundary conditions, you need to remove Dirichlet boundary conditions for them. You need to introduce some dynamical fields which you have frozen at the boundaries. And we will see it in the example of E-string, how it exactly happens. Okay, questions about this? Well, that's right. You just, yes, you remove these boundary conditions. You make this, you know, the, the things that you have frozen, you now integrate over. Exactly. And again, since we have, you know, this full 6D, in 6D story is complicated to understand because we don't know what the 6D uh, theory is in terms of fields. It's some strongly coupled theory. But this is the theory of fields. So when we will further reduce this to four dimensions, this just will be basically a direct dimensional reduction, okay. some kind of a dimensional reduction to four dimensions. And then again, since you gauge this symmetry in 5D, you should gauge it in 4D. This is kind of an understanding that you should have. Yes? Yes? So you, that's right. Well, because we have here a gay, so the question is that does always this undoing of Dirichlet boundary condition correspond to gauging some symmetries? If you have frozen, your boundary condition have frozen some gauge fields, you need to make them dynamical again. So you, you are gauging them. If you, know, so you have some theory without gauge fields and you put some Dirichlet boundary condition, you don't need to gauge any symmetry when you remove them. There was another question. Yes. Right. So, right. so the question is, we have two different theories here. There is a 5D theory living here, a 5D theory living here. There are different 5D theories. So what we are doing now when we are gauging this, uh, these uh, theories, we are identifying the gauge field, uh, you know, the, the, the gauge field at the boundary here, the 5D gauge boundary. Uh, uh, the 5D gauge field at the boundary here, and the 5D, another 5D gauge field which lives here, we identify them at the boundary. This is the continuity you are talking about, and we make it dynamical. Okay? Okay, so we are done with these general uh, statements. So let me summarize what you need to understand in order to start uh, really understanding compactification. So there are, from this discussion, there are very little things that you need to know. There, there, is a, there are not many things you need to know. Of course, if you know more things, you will be able to say more things in four dimensions. But uh, to derive some non-trivial results in four dimensions, you basically need to answer several questions. You need to, under, to take some six-dimensional theory, okay, anything you want. And you need to understand what is the symmetry and what are the anomalies? Okay. We will soon discuss why anomalies are useful. It will be very useful if you, when you go to five dimensions. This 6D theory in five dimensions is described by gauge theory. So this you need to find. So you need to find a 5D, uh, 6D theory that upon compactification on a circle is described by fields in terms of Lagrangians by gauge theory with group, with some gauge group G5D gauge and some meta, okay? And then in five dimensions, the, mo the moment you understood what the 5D theory is, it, you need to do two things. First, you need to study domain walls, these du duality domain walls. And second thing you need to, to study is the boundary conditions. So 
So the claim is the moment, you, again, you found a 6D theory, which has a 5D uh, gauge theory description, and you understand about this 5D description, these two things, you can just do a very simple thing. You can take your 6D theory, put it on a cylinder, turn on some flux, okay? and then this flux in five dimensions will be engineered, let me draw it here, by some domain wall. So the theory you will get in five dimensions will be just a five-dimensional theory with a domain wall. Domain wall corresponds to, to the flux. And then you just reduce it, reduce to 4D. That's the algorithm. How you understand compactifications on a cylinder with flux. As simple as that, okay? And now what we will do, we will, uh, uh, we will understand this program in a very particular example and see what are the consequences. Any questions? How much time do I have? Five minutes. Yes? Oh, so the question was to give more details about reducing this, uh, the 5D theory to 4D. So what we, we are already in 5D, so basically you should think of this. This is the, five, this is the 5D direction. This is the, the circle is the 6D direction. So we are already in 5D. So this is the picture we have. The boundaries are four-dimensional. Okay? So now we are compactifying this direction. We are basically getting rid of this size. Okay? And then we are only left with the four-dimensional theory. Okay, so in the five, five minutes that I have, let me start, uh, give you basic facts about the E-string theory, and we will continue in, uh, in one hour with more details. Okay. So this was very, very generic discussion, so now I need to show you that it actually works, at least on some examples. Okay, so the example uh, I have chosen, because it's uh, rather beautiful, is this example of uh, the E string. So it's some six-dimensional theory. And again, the only thing you need to know is that about this theory is that you understand Oh, we, we understand now all these pieces here, and I will uh, describe them to you now. So first of all, we know that this theory exists in six dimension, and I, as I already mentioned, this theory has a very beautiful symmetry, which is E8, a huge symmetry, and it is E8. Another thing you, 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 we understand is that anomaly polynomial is known. And it took a lot of years to derive this anomaly polynomial in rather sophisticated techniques, and it was done very recently by Omori, Shimizu, Tachikawa, and Yonekura. So there was a lot of hard work which went into this computation, but the bottom line is that we know not just what the symmetry is of this theory, but also what are the, dif the, the, the different hoofed anomalies. And we can package this information about hoofed anomalies in what is called uh, anomaly polynomial. So we are in six dimensions, so anomaly polynomial is some eight form. And you need to write the most general eight form that you, you can think of using all the characteristic classes that you have uh, available for this particular theory and fix the coefficient. So I will not write to you the anomaly polynomial of this theory. It will take the whole uh, blackboard. But just to give you a feel of it, so there are some numbers that you need to compute. And these guys computed them. And then there are some characteristic classes that you can have. So there are, it looks something like that. And plus many, many more terms. Okay, so these are some characteristic classes that what you need to do to compute the anomalies is to fix these numbers. So this task was done. We will not discuss it. We will just assume it is correct. Okay? 
there is always a chance that somebody made a mistake. But uh, then you need to find a mistake. Okay? So these are the two basic things that we know about 6D. So this is the 6D part of the story. And 5D part of the story is the thing I already told you, is that if you take this particular theory, this 6D theory, and put it on a circle and turn on holonomy, which takes E8 to SO14 times U1, the theory you get in 5D is SU2 theory plus eight hypers. Okay? And all of what I said is rather complicated. For example, you see, we have broken here E8 to SO14 times U1. What is the symmetry of the theory we get in 5D? Okay, you have eight hypers of SU2. So the symmetry that you, you get actually here is SO16. And there is another symmetry which comes from instanton. So there is an SO16 times U1 symmetry that you see in 5D. So the precise statement is that the SO16 that you see here is kind of accidental. It's important that it has this SO14 times U1 group. Okay? So the SO14 inside the SO16, some SO14 inside the SO16 is the SO14 that you got from six dimensions. And then you get this instantonic U1 and this U1, which completes the SO14 to SO16. And one of these combinations of the two combinations is related to the KK symmetry, to the kaluza klein symmetry that you have on a circle. And another is this U1 that you want to find. So there are, this story is, is uh, rather non, this statement by itself is rather uh, non-trivial. But from here, we can immediately answer one thing. We can understand that we will have, if we will start from six-dimensional E-string theory and compactify it on a Riemann surface with punctures, there are certain punctures which have SU2 flavor symmetry. Okay. With proper boundary conditions, there will be punctures that will have SU2 flavor symmetry. And that, uh, starting from here, we will continue. <laughs>